Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> Some of you, I recognize your face, but you know, I'm not really good with. I'll get your names down eventually. So uh, anyway, good to be here. We're we're not completely moved in, but you know how that goes. We're working at it. We don't have internet yet, so that's not all bad actually, because uh, you know that way I don't have to know what's going on. But uh, I can turn on the TV and find out. But uh, I had a, I, I thought I'd, I'd mention this before I get started. I've had several people ask me, why did you move to Huntsville? Like, like it's a bad place to move to. You know, like, we're here for a reason, you know. We're happy. But uh, uh, what happened, uh, uh, we were, we sort of wanted to move to, uh, well, my son lives in Houston. And I love my son. I love my daughter-in-law. But I didn't really want to move to Houston. And then uh, you would laugh if you lived in Texas about Houston. But uh, then my daughter lives in Kansas City. Love my daughter, my grandkids, but uh, didn't we didn't particularly want to move to Kansas City. So we we'd sort of narrowed it down to Kentucky, Tennessee, or uh, Alabama. And uh, Penny's done all kind of research. She was looking at all types of things, and uh, uh, we we felt that uh, the Huntsville area had more that we were looking for than anywhere else so i could say sorry about your luck but uh but we're, we're glad we're here uh but anyway we uh we're happy to be here and and uh, we, found, we we had a found a place in athens and uh so and i've known gary beam and rick beam and gary petty for years and they're all three good friends of ours <clears throat> so you know everything just seemed to be like this would be a good place so we're looking forward to being here i know next week will be up in uh, Middle Tennessee. My Penny's father, many of some of you know Charles Smith and Ellen Smith, and her father, Penny's father, died is 10 years ago. And it's, boy, it seems like not that long ago, but I remember I was at Camp Woodman one year and I got back, the day we got back, uh, Sunday, and he died literally like uh, about an hour or two after I got back from camp. So we uh, will be going up there next week uh, spending time there. But uh, again, we're happy to be here. Uh, anything we can do to help you, uh, that's what we're here for. And uh, and just looking forward to being here. Uh, you know, the, the obvious t topic today would be about the 4th of July. And, but I know Mr. Beam's going to speak on that next week. So I thought I'd look, take a look at a different topic. And uh, th this is a subject that I have spoken on uh, numerous times over the years <clears throat> and uh, I think it's when I look at what's going on in our world and our country today I think this would be a good topic for us to think about here as we go into this holiday weekend or uh, period but there's a there's a phrase my mother used to say and you probably heard this phrase sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me that that is such a that is so wrong. It, 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 I have found that sometimes words can hurt more than than about anything. And sometimes when people, and I'm talking about myself too, if you say the wrong thing, it can take you so long to uh, get over it. Sometimes people, you know, hold things inside for years and years and years. So I thought I would start off by telling a little something happened to me and i was trying to realize how long ago it was but it's been it's been over 20 years ago but uh, i worked in healthcare uh distribution <clears throat> much of my life i've been an elder for over 30 years but i've only, i was only employed for, from uh the church uh for less than 12 years and uh, when they asked me if i would go to work uh, I, I was glad to do it and we're glad we're able to do it but we never realized we didn't really think it'd be 12 years, but uh, it's amazing how that happens. But, but anyway, uh, back when healthcare once there was a, a situation, uh, we uh, the people that I worked with, we, we decided that every once a month we were going on Monday morning, <clears throat> once a month we're all going to get together and have breakfast at the Cracker Barrel. Uh, and I was living in Nashville at the time. And uh, we were going to talk about things and get all, you know, ready for uh, for the week. And there's probably about seven or eight of us, I believe. And uh, we all agreed to be there, and we're all there, and everybody was having breakfast. But one person didn't show up, and his name was Stuart. Now, Stuart was a good guy, 
and uh, Stewart uh, did have a tendency sometime to uh, to say he was going to do things and didn't actually do it. But overall, he he was a good guy, and uh, so we we wondered where Stewart was, and uh, we talked a little bit about it, and it turned out Stewart just didn't come. But uh, what happened is a friend of mine, uh, one of the guys I worked with, name his name was Mark. <clears throat> Afterwards, I mentioned to Mark, and you know, we're talking about where Stewart, why didn't he show up? Blah 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 blah, and um, I th sent Mark a voicemail. And I, you know, if you send a voicemail, then you type in the number and then you move on. So I, I, I sent Mark a voicemail and I, at the end of the voicemail, I said, you know, that Stewart is just useless. Then I typed in Mark's number and then I realized I had sent it to Stewart. <laughs> yeah. You might be laughing, but I was panicking. <clears throat> and uh, I remember calling my customer service rep and asking if there's a way you can go into voicemail and eliminate something. And, of course, I couldn't. And Stuart got to hear that I called him useless. Now, he was, he, he was a good guy. And uh, I haven't seen him for years. And, I, you know, I don't know what he's doing now. But it was just a total thoughtless act that I said without thinking about it, just without, you know, no big deal, just... I said, Stuart's useless. And then Stuart got to hear that I called him useless. And of course, I had to apologize. But you know, even though you apologize, he knew what I said. He, he, he knew what I said. Well, <clears throat> I want to speak about the words we speak today. I guess you call it, you could say the tongue. I've got, I could title it the tongue or the words we speak. But I think it'd be a good thing to think about because it's not our country and the world in general, but just looking at our country, do people really think about what they say? You know, we've got politicians, they just argue back and forth, they don't want to get along, they don't want to work together. There's no such thing as uh, cutting each other a little slack. You got to get your side. You know, the Supreme Court made the decision about Roe versus Wade, which of course I was very happy about, but they actually didn't Outlaw abortion, which, quite frankly, we know that's that's not abortion's wrong; it's murder. But they didn't outlaw it; they turned it to the states. But people are going ballistic about how dare the Supreme Court do something like that? When, of course, we know it should have been; it should have never been legal in the first place. Now, over in James. I'm going to spend some time in James later. I just want to read one word, uh, one verse, I should say, in the book of James. Did you bring me my, my glasses? I see the woman's taking over now. Here she comes. You, can, you want to come on up here and let everybody see? <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, James, James chapter 3. Verse 8. Now this verse can be sobering and it can also be a little encouraging. Because it says, no man, meaning no person, can tame the tongue. So when you look at yourself and I look at myself and I feel like, man, I can't. I say things sometimes. I think, why did I do this? Why did I say that? And I'm thinking, well, wait, we're all in the same boat to some degree. You know, some are worse than others. But nobody has got it completely together about the words we say. We all make mistakes from time to time. And it's just the way it is in life. <clears throat> and it's not right because, notice, it's an unruly evil. We can say words and things that are so hateful and so disparaging to other people. Just like I made that just that flipping comment about uh, my friend, uh, Stewart and said he's useless and of course that was wrong and he wasn't useless and he isn't useless but yet it was so easy to say it was it not without thinking what I was saying and it says the, the tongue is full of deadly poison now nobody wants to drink a little poison but we can really cause ourselves a lot of problems with the words we say now today I'd like to speak about the words we say, how we handle our tongue. And does your tongue get you into trouble at times? Well, mine does. 
you know, hopefully not usually, but I think we've all can look back at times where we said things and, and done things that we just shouldn't have done. And as James said, no person can tame that tongue completely. It's an unruly evil, it's full of deadly poison. It's a problem, is it not? So I, I thought I'd mention a few things here about that as we, as we uh, celebrate the 4th of July and the fact that we're so fortunate to have a country. You know, I remember once uh, being at the Feast of Tabernacles. I don't know what made me think of that. I Probably the flag down there. And I was in another country. And I remember a person, a member there, said, do you know what is my least favorite hymn in the hymnal? I thought, well, there's, I don't know, what, what is it? And this person from another country said, America the Beautiful. And I said, well, that's one of my favorite. Now, it's not in the hymnal anymore. It used to be back. And I said, well, why? And he says, because I'm not an American. I don't care about singing about America. Well, we should be proud to be an American. But yet, America's got plenty of issues we need to deal with. This isn't the kingdom of God we're in yet. But yet, we should be proud to be an American. And, and I still remember when that particular man, this is years and years ago, complaining about having to sing about America the Beautiful because he wasn't from America. But uh, let's take a look and think about a few things here today if we could. Number one, I just got a few numbers down here jotted down. Are we consciously working toward controlling our tongue or the words we say? <clears throat> Are we consciously working <clears throat> toward controlling our tongue or the words we say. Over in Psalm, read a couple Psalms here. Psalm 19, <clears throat> Psalm 19, I'll turn to first. Yeah, I have spoken on this topic over the years quite a few times, and yet every time I speak on it, I look at myself and say, I hadn't got it all together yet. I'm still not completely controlling at times all the time. But in verse 14 of Psalm 19, now this is a Psalm of David. A psalm of David. <clears throat> David finished the Psalm by saying, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. So what's in our heart comes out of our mouth. It's 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 it never fails. We can keep it in at times, but what is in our heart comes out of our mouth at times. And sometimes it's like we need to cleanse our mouth, our heart, do we not? So at the words of my mouth, David said, and let the meditation of what's even in my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So God the Father and Jesus Christ are our strength and they're our redeemer. And yet, he, David said he wanted to have better thoughts in his heart. And he didn't want the words that came out of his mouth to be a stumbling block. Any times there were for David too, were they not? Now another <clears throat> Psalm over ch uh, number 39, chapter, uh, Psalm 39. <clears throat> and this is also a Psalm of David. And the very first word, a very first verse of Psalm 39, David said, I said, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. You know, by what he says. Notice, I'll restrain my mouth with a muzzle. What do they put on a dog that bites people? A muzzle. And David said, he wanted a muzzle on his mouth to keep and from saying things that were unacceptable. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. Now my daughter, who's now in her early 40s, it's hard to believe, <clears throat> she's got five kids. <clears throat> so she's, she's now two of them are grown, but three of them are, any, you know, they're in various stages. One's only three years old. Uh, she's three, yeah. So I can't remember how my daughter's 
daughter is. Sad. It's called old age. I'm not sure why I said that. <laughs> anyway, I'm young and young and good. Put a muzzle on my mouth. But uh, but my daughter used to say mean things when she's growing up at times. And we've all done it. And I would say, Margie, why'd you say that? And she said, well, you know I didn't mean it. Well, then why do you say it? Again, I'm a good daughter, but I'm thinking we do things like that, don't we? Now, over in 1 Samuel, this, this thought of are we consciously working toward controlling our tongue and the words we say, over in 1 Samuel 25. <clears throat> you know, it was only, I don't know, a day or two after we uh, uh, signed the papers to buy our house in Athens and... Uh, that we saw where Huntsville was rated the number one place to live in the country. That was pretty encouraging there. Didn't say Athens, it said Huntsville. So I don't know where Athens is on the list, but I uh, consider that Huntsville. But here's the situation, the, old, the story of Nabal. Now in verse uh, 2 of 1 Samuel 25, Now there was a man in Mayan <clears throat> whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmish, and the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance, and the man was harsh and evil in all his doings, <clears throat> and he was of the house of Caleb. Now, when David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. <clears throat> Thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shears. Your shepherds were with us. We didn't hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. <clears throat> Ask your young men, and they will tell you, therefore, let my young men find favor in your sight. And we come on a feast day. Please give us whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son, son David. So they're asking for a little help. Now, David, at this particular time, was, was running from Saul. who wanted to kill him. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal, according to all these words in the name of David, and they waited and Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Well, actually, he's the one that killed Goliath. So I would think they would have probably heard about him. <clears throat> he said, There's many servants nowadays that break away from one from his master. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to the men when I don't even know where they're from. So the young men turned back on the hills and went back and they came and told this to David. Well, I don't think I need to read the whole story because <clears throat> you know what happened. David said, put on your swords, we are going. We're going to get Nabal. Now, you know the story, Abigail came to his rescue. In fact, I'll read a couple of verses down in verse 14. Verse 14, <clears throat> now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David, <clears throat> he sent messengers to greet our master, and he reviled them. But, th but these men were very good to us, and we weren't hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. And they said, we did all these good things. And Abigail heard it. Verse 18, Abigail made haste, took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine. She, in a way, you could say she almost overdid it because she wanted to make sure that the anger of David was quenched. <clears throat> so she took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five seas of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs. He loaded them on donkeys. And she went. Now, she didn't tell her husband Nabal, but she went to David. 
In verse 23, when Abigail saw David, just hitting a few highlights here, she hastened to dismount from the donkey. She fell on her face before David. She bowed down to the ground and she fell at his feet. And she said, oh, on me, my Lord, and on me, let this iniquity be. Please let your maid servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maid servant. Please don't let my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. And she begged David <clears throat> for help. And David was impressed. And David did not send the men to fight. Now in verse 35, just kind of wrapping up this story. So David received from her hand what she brought him. And he, he said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I've heeded your voice. I've respected your person. So Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was holding a feast in his house, like a feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him. He was very drunk. Therefore, she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. Because David was a man of war. In fact, he wasn't even told to build the temple because God said he was a bloody man. But God, of course, loved David, but David had made plenty of mistakes. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal, his wife told him these things that his heart died within him. He became like a stone. Then it happened after about 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal <clears throat> and he died. So Nabal has spoken very harshly, very foolishly, very stupidly, quite frankly. And I look at that and I say, he paid a heavy price for that. And yet, are we, and of course I include myself, <clears throat> are we working toward controlling the words we say, our tongue? <clears throat> Sometimes I think, what would it be like to be married to one of these uh, one of the entertainers or one of these, you know, I mean, can you imagine being married to one of these prima donnas? And when I say prima donnas, I don't know if that word means, only, I think prima donnas can mean man or woman, but uh, you know, can, we, can you imagine, I don't know how many of you remember Dennis Rodman. Can you imagine being married to Dennis Rodman uh, or Madonna? I mean, could you imagine after the initial sort of excitement wears off, which would probably last maybe a day, you know, maybe a week, who knows. Wouldn't it be awful? Be terrible. <clears throat> be awful. So evil words <clears throat> can cause much, a lot of hurt, a lot of sorrow in life. How many murders are started by foolish and hateful words? So are we consciously working toward controlling our tongue? Remember, no man has totally tamed their tongue. When I say man, no person. Woman, man, boy, girl. We all make mistakes. But <clears throat> the second point, I guess, follows right along with the first point, and that is God expects a Christian to work on controlling their tongue. God expects a Christian to work on controlling their tongue. We may not be able to tame it completely because nobody has. But are we working at it? <clears throat> or do we just spew out things without thinking? Over in James. <clears throat> now I'm going to turn to James 3 later, which is a very, probably the most interesting chapter in the Bible about the words we speak. But over in James chapter 1, notice what, <clears throat> what, Paul, what James says. Verse 26, this is, this is something for you and me to think about. James 1, 26, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and doesn't bridle the tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is just what I said about Stuart. It's useless. Let's see, Stuart wasn't useless. But if we don't work to bridle our tongue and we call ourselves a Christian, well, that's not a good situation, is it? Verse 27 tells us what to think about. 
pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. And you can look at the Greek, and it's just not just orphans, but the downtrodden, those that need help, and to keep oneself unspotted <clears throat> from the world. Proverbs 15. <clears throat> Proverbs 15. It's one verse in this proverb. Verse 4. <clears throat> A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Man, you can make a person feel so good by what you say. I mean, you made me feel good today just being so welcoming when we walked in. Even Mrs. Keith. You, 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 you said a couple of things I won't say, but... Uh, uh, yeah. You know... Kind of kidding. You know. <clears throat> I'm, I'm almost always kidding. You'll find that I kid well, maybe too much, but uh, it is what it is. But a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Breaks the spirit. I was watching something <clears throat> on TV. It was an interview with Britt Farr, a football player. He was talking about how his father never once ever complimented him about anything. And it was really interesting, wasn't it? And he was he was going. His father would always he he would always complain to him constantly. But he said, you know, he knew his father loved him. He never felt his father didn't love him, but his father never complimented him. And he said it would have been so nice to just say, "Son, you did a good job." But he said he never would do, do that. He'd always tell him what he what he wasn't doing as well as he could. But like I said, God expects a Christian. <clears throat> to work on controlling our tongue. Now, number three, <clears throat> a tongue <clears throat> that is not controlled can lead to serious problems. Well, I mean, Nabal is a good example, I guess. But let's, let's just kind of briefly look at another example here over in Judges, Judges chapter 11. This is one of the sort of enigmas in the Bible. Because this man is listed in Hebrews 11 in the faith chapter. So there's positives and negatives here. But here in verse uh, chapter 11 of Judges, <clears throat> Jephthah, who if you'll see if you look over in Hebrews 11, he's listed in the faith chapter in a positive way. Now Jephthah the Gilead was a mighty man of valor, but he was a son of a harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah. And goes on and Jephthah verse 3 he fled from his brothers he dwelt in the land of Tob and worthless men banded together with Jephthah and he went out raiding with him and he was one thing after another Jephthah uh, had some issues to put it mildly dropping down to verse 29 <clears throat> so here is Jephthah the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and he passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he advanced toward the people of Ammon. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will deliver the people of Ammon into my hands. Now, it's fine to make a vow to God, but what a stupid comedy makes here. He said, Then whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the people of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I'll offer it up as a burnt offering. What was the point of that? He didn't know what was going to come out of his house. And what came out of his house? His daughter. His daughter. Now, I've heard this explained <clears throat> more than one way, but let's just put it this way. Regardless, he didn't... It was a stupid comment. It was a very stupid comment. But a tongue that is not controlled can lead to serious problems. So let's turn to James chapter 3, chapter that's normally is almost always brought up when this <clears throat> is mentioned. 
words about the words we use. Let's notice what James says about our tongue, the words we use. Start in verse 5. Even so, uh, James 3, verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member. Our tongue is not a big part of our body, is it not? It's a little member. Little member. Behold, it boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire can kindle? The tongue is a fire. Oh, man, it can it, the words we say cause problems. <clears throat> wow, it can cause problems. It's a fire. It's a world of iniquity. The tongue is set so among our members that it defiles the whole body. So we can have all kind of problems. Verse 7, every kind of beast and every kind of bird, every kind of reptile and every creature of the sea, it's tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But there's this verse 8 again, but no one can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil. It's full of deadly poison. <clears throat> then it goes a little further here. This is where we really should focus these next two verses. Verse 9 and 10. With it, with our tongue, we bless our God and Father. How many times over the years have you seen people praising God, saying, oh, I love God, this, that, and the other thing. But with the same tongue, we curse men made in the image of God. So we can talk about how we love God. <clears throat> Then we can just slice up human beings with our tongue. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. And then here he, he puts it in summation here. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Like one translation said, it's just not right. It's just not right, is it? Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> now you'll know Matthew 5 clearly because that's when we see the Beatitudes. But then you drop down to verse 10 of Matthew 5. Notice what it says. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. So if somebody is reviling you and saying all manner of lies about you, if they're not true, God sees it. Now it hurts. Of course it hurts. It hurts to be falsely accused. It even hurts to be told you're wrong even when you know you're wrong, although it's good to know it because the Bible will correct us. But yet, if someone reviles you, persecutes you, and says all kind of evil against you falsely for who? For God's sake. Rejoice. And be exceedingly glad. Now that's hard for me. I think, man, uh, so I'm going to be glad if somebody is lying about me? But yet it says rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecute the prophets who were before you. And you know, this was written by Matthew. Think what happened to all the apostles and all the martyrs through the years, through the age. God knows. God knows. One other psalm here on this point. <clears throat> psalm 4. One verse here again. Psalm 4, another psalm of David. 
It's interesting here. It says, to the chief musician with flutes, <laughs> a psalm of David. Psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King, my God, for to you I will pray. To you I will pray. And it talks about how if we have an issue, take it to God. Take it to God. You know, God knows what's going on. God knows <clears throat> when you're not being treated fairly. But it says, meditate, take it to God. Because God understands. So like I said, like I mentioned, a tongue that is not controlled, just like Jephthah, and it can lead to serious problems. Now, let's go a little deeper here. A lying tongue. You know, sometimes we can say things that are true and then cause a lot of problems and a lot of hurt. But a lying tongue, when a person is flat out lying, and you know, it happens, does it not? Do you not get lied to sometimes? You know, I mean, just watch commercials sometimes. The best, everything's the best. <laughs> oh, me, it's crazy. But a lying tongue can really learn, lead to serious problems. It's so easy to exaggerate or just plain lie to make oneself look better in our own eyes. But God knows when we're lying. It's the ninth commandment. I gave a, I've given a sermon on the ninth commandment <clears throat> numerous times. And one time I gave a sermon on the ninth commandment. And uh, after I gave it, there's this one person in the congregation I was in was going around telling everybody that I called What do I say, she or he or, or what's the new term? The whatever it is. Sorry about that. In this particular case, as a woman. She's going around telling people, I called her a liar. I was calling her name out in church. I didn't call her name out. Now, she did lie some, but yet I didn't say her name. Didn't say her name. And I'm not going to say it now either. <coughs> There was nobody in here. But she was going on about how I, in the sermon, I was calling her a liar and I called out her name. And I thought, well, you know, actually, she, she did lie some. But I didn't say her name. But here, over here in 1 Samuel 31, 1 Samuel 31, here's a situation where a lie got this person in a lot of trouble. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 31. 31, verse 1. Here's the death of Saul. <clears throat> so the Philistine, beginning in verse 1. So the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines, and they fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Now the Philistines fought hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed three of Saul's sons, one of which was Jonathan. Now the battle became intense. You notice I didn't mention the names because I couldn't pronounce them. Now the battle became intense against Saul. And the archers hit him. And he was severely wounded by the archers. And Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword, thrust it through me, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer wouldn't, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and he died also. So Saul has three sons, his armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. <clears throat> so Saul fell on his sword and died, it says it right here. Well, the very next chapter, which is 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, it came to pass after the death of Saul, 
when David had returned from the slaughter of the Malachites, and David had stayed two days in Ziglag, on the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. So it was when he came to David that he fell prostrate on the ground and he prostrated himself. And David said to him, Where have you come from? He said, I've escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, Well, how did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, The people have fled from the, the, from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and, and are dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. And David was very broken up. Sam, uh, jo Jonathan was his best friend, wasn't he not? David had respect for Saul. So David said to the young man, who told you that Saul and David, that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? The young man who told him said, As it happened by chance, I happened to be on Mount Gilboa. There was Saul leaning on his spear. And indeed, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. <clears throat> and when he looked behind him, he saw me and he called to me and said, I said, Here I am. And, he, and, and Saul said, Who are you? And I said, I'm an Amalekite. And he said to me again, well, please stand over me, kill me, for anguish has come upon me, but life still remains in me. So I stood over him and I killed him, but the chapter before said Saul fell on the sword himself. So this Amalekite was more, almost certainly, trying to get on David's good side by lying. So I stood over him, I killed him. Because I sure he couldn't live after he had fallen. I took the crown that was on his head, the bracelet that was on his arm, and I brought them here to my Lord. He thought David may give him some kind of bounty or something for that. So David took hold of his own clothes. He tore them. So did all the men who were with him. And they mourned. <clears throat> and they fasted till evening. For Saul and Jonathan his son for the people of the Lord, for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. And David said to the young man who told him, Where are you from? He said, I'm the son of an alien, an Amalekite. And David said, How was it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed or the king? David called one of the young men and said, Go near, execute him. And he struck him with a sword and he died. So David said to him, Your blood is on your own head, for your own mouth has testified against you and said you've killed the Lord's anointed. Well, almost certainly he didn't. Because he came upon the crown, the bracelet, he took it, he wanted to get whatever from David. But he lied. And because of that, he died. You know, I, I had a friend, still know him, <clears throat> I always think this is kind of funny. He, uh, you might not, but laugh anyway. You know, humor me. <clears throat> so I act like it's, this is funny. But uh, but anyway, this this one guy, he was a uh, in college. He was a uh, he was a uh, sophomore, I think, in college. And he was. I was on a camp, on a little uh, get together out at uh, uh, a get together one time with a bunch of people, and he was telling me all about how he had broken all these track records at La Cunata High School. Where is that? It's in California, when I lived in California. And he was telling me about all these records he had broken, and I was very impressed. I thought, wow, man, I didn't know he was that good. Then his father said, Stan, can I talk to you a minute? He said, I don't know why he's saying that. He wasn't even on the track team. Because he said, wait, the track meets were on the Sabbath. So here he was telling me that he broke all these track records and he wasn't even on the track team. Now, this is a good guy. Penny knows him. <clears throat> He's a good guy. Won't mention his name either. Say, I could really get in trouble here. I could, I could be blackballed big time. But, but <clears throat> got a lot of these. But, uh, but I still remember that. He wasn't even on the track team. And I was dumb enough to believe he set all these track records. I wondered how he won some of these events because he didn't look like he was that fit. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, 
I still remember that. Final one here, sort of summation of all what we've talked about this afternoon. <clears throat> that is, are we letting our tongue... Now, we've got all these points. I'm just kind of go back and summarize them again. <clears throat> okay. got number one, I put, are we constantly working toward controlling our tongue? Number two, God expects a Christian to work on controlling their tongue. Number three, a tongue or words that are not controlled can lead to serious problems. And, of course, a lying tongue can lead to even more serious problems. <clears throat> but when all this is said and done, I don't know why I'm clearing my throat so much today. Probably all that dust where we live. It's called Huntsville. No, it's called, it's called Athens. Now, we're living in a new subdivision. There's only four people living in the area so far. And I don't think none of these Internet people want to take the time to come out there and give us Internet service. <clears throat> anyway, you don't care, but I thought I'd tell you anyway. <clears throat> Are we letting our tongue allow us to become bitter or angry with others? You know, people are going to say things to you sometimes that are going to be hard to take. And yet, I look at myself and I've said things over the years that really I shouldn't have said. And yet I ask God to forgive me and, and, I, and I, think, I know He does when we try. I remember once there was a situation there was a Y-O-U <clears throat> back in Worldwide. There was going to be a Y-O-U uh, activity, a big dinner, and everybody was supposed to sign up if their, if their uh, teens were going to come to the activity. And uh, so everybody signed up. They had several weeks to do it. And then the day of the activity that evening, I got a phone call from a member and said that they didn't sign up and they wanted their... Uh, two children to go to the event. Well, I didn't care. didn't matter to me. It didn't matter to me because I didn't have to make the food, as you know. So um, it's like, oh, yeah, sure. And then I contacted the uh, <clears throat> the person that was sort of over overseeing it, and they said, no, they can't come because they didn't sign the list. And I thought, well, okay. So then I told them the wife of the, did not speak to me for over six months. And I didn't even have anything to do with it. I could have cared less. Again, because I didn't have to do the work to make the food. You know, it's, it's easy. you know how men are. Just bring on the food as long as we don't have to do anything. It's sad, is it not? <laughs> it's actually kind of nice being a man, not having to do food. You don't want me to cook your food. It wouldn't, it wouldn't go well. <clears throat> but that person didn't speak to me for over six months. And then one week at church, she was just normal again. I always wondered, I wonder what made her finally forget it. And I'm glad she did. But it's amazing. But if we let our tongue and the words we hear that others may say, if we let it if we, if we let it become us become bitter or angry, we're just hurting ourselves, is what we're doing. Over in Proverbs fourteen. <clears throat> Proverbs fourteen. <clears throat> yeah, I mentioned the uh, more useless information you probably don't care to hear, but but there's only four other, uh, three other family or houses that people are living in right around us right now. And uh, they're all real friendly, real nice. And one across the street found out I used to live in New Orleans. And uh, he got all excited and because he and his wife are from Baton Rouge. And he said, we're going to have a crawfish boil. And I thought, <laughs> thought I just said, I just kind of just let that go. Now, I'm not going to the crawfish boil. Don't be worried. But, uh, but uh, I thought, you know, maybe, maybe the first thing I should tell him is, is, is uh, I don't eat crawfish. Well, maybe I should have told him. That's what you'd have done when, yeah, that's what you <laughs> Anyway, I'll just, I just want to ask the doorbell for a few days. <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, I know it was pretty funny. Hey, I got somebody likes me. Proverbs 14, verse 10. 
The heart knows its own bitterness, and a stranger doesn't share its joy. You know, when we're hurting, and there's not a person in here that, that hasn't been hurt in one way or the other, and sometimes in many ways. <clears throat> you know what? We know it. But are we, am I, are you, each of us, controlling our emotions, or are we letting our emotions control us? Because it's not worth getting angry and upset over something you can't do anything about. You know, we can really only really control ourselves when it's all said and done. Ephesians. <clears throat> we'll begin to wrap this up. Ephesians 4. Letter from Paul. Verse 25 <clears throat> to 27 of Ephesians 4. Paul says, Therefore, put away lying. Each one speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of one another. Hey, we're all in this together, and we're all far from what we want to be. I trust we're working toward striving to be like our elder brother Jesus Christ and our Father, but we're not there yet. None of us are. Be angry and do not sin. Man, I get angry at some of the stuff I see going on in the world. It's, we should get angry. But it's not a sin to be angry about what's wrong, what's not right. But don't let it get you to the point that you're bitter and angry at, at others. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Nor give place <clears throat> to the devil. In other words... We're to be careful what we say. Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed from your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. We are to help each other. I, when I first graduated from college at the University of Tennessee, I took a job with a with a company, a uh, healthcare company, American Hospital Supply. They got bought out by another company, and it was a very good job. I was very very blessed on this job, <clears throat> and I worked uh, uh, with this company. And then they were bought out by another company, and and I, I was very very blessed over the years with this company I worked for. But I had down there in New Orleans a bad boss. He was not a good boss. And uh, I was young, you know, I was, you know, 21 years old, 22 years old. And, and I would get so upset with some of the stuff he was doing. And he was wrong. He was a bad boss. And I got to the point, and I would talk to a couple of the other sales reps. And, and uh, I know myself and at least one other was just the point we were ready to quit. And I was so, I would get so frustrated. I could still remember, I would grip my steering wheel so tight when I was driving because I'd get I'd start thinking about this man who I'm renamed, remained nameless. But I kept thinking about I'd get so upset. Almost the point I almost uh, quit this job. But one day I got a phone call from my area manager who actually is in Dallas was where the headquarters was. And he told me, I know what's going on relax, we're going to take care of things. And thankfully, thankfully, I didn't quit. I just realized my, my, his boss is going to take care of things. And they did. They did. But I could have just, who knows what the future would have taken as far as my work job and so forth. And I was blessed many, many times on this job. I almost quit, but that older boss called and told me, don't worry, it's going to be taken care of. So it's so easy to criticize others. And I don't like it when I'm criticized, and you don't like it when you're criticized. But yet, criticism, if not handled properly, 
can eventually turn to anger, and anger can turn to bitterness. And it doesn't help you. It doesn't help me when we let that happen to us. So what is the important point in summation? Well, we're to look to God and ask God to help us control the words we say. We're to look to God and ask God to help us control the words we say. A couple other scriptures, and I'll close. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. In all serious, seriousness, we're, we're really well, we're thrilled to be here uh, and very happy. I'm looking forward to Peter and I being here and getting to know all of you and you know helping out in Birmingham and, and uh, Fulton and probably up in Middle Tennessee and probably Chattanooga a little bit too. But we're looking forward. We'll be here most of this will be our home congregation, so we're looking forward to being here. Verse 14 and 15 of Hebrews 12. Pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking diligently lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up causing trouble. By this, many become defiled. Bitterness can defile me, it can defile you. I cannot imagine how many times, probably virtually everybody in here, have had things said about them, things done that really weren't fair, humanly speaking. God knows what's going on. Let's us look forward. Because God will take care of the things that are not right. And over in Philippians chapter 4, it may sound a little Pollyanna here, but it's not. This is what Paul is telling the Philippian church, which quite frankly was one of the poorer churches that he dealt with. And here's what Paul told the Philippian church, verse 6 and 7 and 8 of Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing. Well, hey, when you have health problems, you're going to be anxious. You know, it's not that we don't have concerns and worry sometimes, but just know God's going to take care of it. He's The bottom line is being in the kingdom. We're going to go through some rough times. Let's face it, we are going through rough times as a country. I mean, we just went to the grocery store the other day. There's things that are, prices are ridiculously high. I mean, ridiculously high. I know when we were in this, when we were in uh, Texas, somebody would bring us eggs almost every, I didn't realize how fortunate we were. That's all, anybody got eggs, I'll take them. But uh, <clears throat> I like that girl that keeps laughing. Uh, I don't expect eggs. But any produce will do. But anyway, <clears throat> Philippians 6. But in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. God wants to know what's on our mind. God wants to know when we're hurting. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, says Paul, <clears throat> whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, he says, meditate on these things. These things. Remember that first scripture, James 3, verse 8. No one can tame the tongue completely, but we can work at it. Only God can truly, completely tame our tongue. Let's ask God to rule in our lives, including the words we say as we strive to become better Christians and better people as we walk toward the kingdom of God.